in just a few moments, we'll have a live performance featuring pianist Harold Brown. That'll be right here on WVPB Charleston, WVBY Beckley, WVBL Bluefield, WVPW Buchanan, WVWV Huntington, WVP Martinsburg, WVKM81, WVPM Morgantown, WVPG Parkersburg, WVDS Petersburg, WVWS Webster Springs, WVMP Wheeling, and online at WVPublic.org. Support is provided by the CAMC Foundation, investing more than $3 million annually in educational assistance for nursing students who will practice at CAMC after graduation. More information at CAMCFoundation.org. Mostly cloudy to overcast throughout the state of West Virginia. Currently, temperatures in the 30s and 40s, a bit of scattered snow in the southeast, scattered rain in the southwest. More scattered snow in the northernmost parts of the state as well as the northern and eastern panhandles. A news update from NPR is next, then live music. Stay tuned. Live from NPR News, I'm Lakshmi Singh. Funeral services are being held this hour for Dante Wright, the 20-year-old black man fatally shot during his encounter with police last week in suburban Minneapolis. From Minnesota Public Radio, Matt Sepik reports. Wright was killed after former officer Kimberly Potter was heard on body camera video shouting taser taser just before firing her gun at Wright while trying to arrest him. Civil rights leader Reverend Al Sharpton will deliver the eulogy. Wright's killing led to a week of sometimes tense protests outside the police station in the suburb of Brooklyn Center just as the murder trial of former officer Derek Chauvin was nearing its end. Potter resigned from the Brooklyn Center Police Department and has been charged with manslaughter. Racial Justice Act Activists say Potter should face a more serious charge of murder. For NPR News, I'm Matt Sepik in Minneapolis. Earth Day is being marked by a global summit on climate change involving dozens of world leaders and by some of the planet's youngest champions for environmental change. Perhaps the most prominent is teenager Greta Thunberg. She testified virtually today at a House Oversight Subcommittee on Fossil Fuels and the Climate Crisis. I don't represent any financial or political interests. I'm not a lobbyist, so I can't negotiate, make deals or compromise. I have nothing to offer you, nor am I a scientist. All I can do is to urge you to listen to and act on the science and to use your common sense. The global battle on climate change was also the focus of the first international summit President Biden's convened since he took office in January. He pledged that the United States will reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by half from 2005 levels by the end of the decade. 200 million COVID-19 vaccine doses have been administered in this country since Biden took office. NPR's Tamara Keith reports people aged 16 and older are now eligible to receive the shots, but the pace of inoculations doesn't seem to be speeding up. There are still a lot of people who want to get vaccinated, but just need the process to be convenient and easy. Others will need to go ahead and get it. I said, great, great. I said, so now you're going to be part of that uh, building my community of immunity. Yes, yes, I'm going to check you off. Because primary care physicians are so trusted, White House officials say they are working with states to get vaccines distributed to more doctor's offices. Tamara Keith, NPR News. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is down 16 points to 34,121. This is NPR News. Johnson & Johnson's shareholders have approved CEO Alex Gorski's nearly $30 million pay plan for 2020. At the company's annual general meeting today, an investor reportedly asked Gorski about the possible link between J&J's COVID-19 vaccine and an extremely rare blood clot condition that's prompted U.S. health officials to temporarily halt the rollout of the drug maker's vaccine. Gorski said, quote, we continue to believe in the positive benefit risk profile of our vaccine, end quote. European regulators who study the reported cases concluded that the benefits far outweigh the risks. J&J's CEO says his company is looking ahead to a U.S. regulatory meeting tomorrow. The publisher of a new Philip Roth biography is suspending its publication. NPR's Elizabeth Blair reports the author has been accused of sexual misconduct. 
Blake Bailey is an award-winning author. His biography of writer John Cheever was a finalist for the Pulitzer. In the 1990s, Bailey taught eighth grade English in New Orleans. According to the Times-Picayune New Orleans Advocate, three of his former students described sexual encounters with him in their early adulthood. One accused him of rape. The New York Times is also reporting a rape accusation by a publishing executive. Bailey was dropped by his literary agency, and now W.W. Norton will pause shipping and promotion of his biography of Philip Roth. The book has received rave reviews and made it to the New York Times bestseller list. Bailey's lawyer tells NPR the author denies the allegations and disagrees with the publisher's decision. Elizabeth Blair, NPR News. I'm Lakshmi Singh, NPR News. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Charles Schwab. Charles Schwab is committed to offering a modern approach to wealth management with personalized financial planning to meet an investor's specific needs. Learn more at schwab.com slash plan. Good afternoon. You're listening to Classical Music here on West Virginia Public Broadcasting. I'm Matt Jackford, your host for this afternoon, and I'm here with a special guest. We have Harold Brown, pianist, as part of our call for performers. Harold, welcome to the show. Thank you. Well, we're glad you're here, and Harold's coming to us from Bramwell, West Virginia, a really cool town in the southern part of the state. Tell us a little bit about Bramwell. Well, Bramwell is, I think it's, it's a rather unique town because it is essentially 140 years old, something like that, mm -hmm. and the whole downtown is still intact. It's, um, every town has some historic houses, but Bramwell, you know, has almost the whole downtown intact, and it's what uh, drew my wife and I to the area. We wanted to move back to to uh, the mountains after being away for many years in mm -hmm. New York City and Washington and Boca Raton, Florida. And we had never been to Bramble and didn't know it existed and happened to come. And, and so we've been there for 10 years now. Okay, that's great. Um, and Bramwell's, I think, an old coal mine, or sort of has a lot of old coal money there. That's where its sort yes, of origins were from. Yes, it has the uh, the home of the coal barons. You right, know, right. they they are still um, quite a number of those beautiful old houses, which are still there. And uh, you know, we try to keep the town alive. Right, right. And the former home of the Bramwell Beer Festival, which was uh, the yes, Oktoberfest. Yes, the Oktoberfest. Yeah, which was a great little festival down there. So you uh, had a journey up here from Bramwell. How was the drive? Everything okay? Well, I avoided coming in February only to have snow. <laughs> yeah. Today it was we were having snow flurries on April 22nd. <laughs> right. We were we he didn't want to do in February cuz he thought there'd be too much snow and then little did you know mid mid April, mid yes. to late April would have some flurries for you. Um so okay. Uh what brought you back Oh, well, we talked about that a little bit. So you're from Tazewell, Virginia, yes. and then you moved away. And then what brought you back? You just happened to well, go to Bramble? It, it, when I was young, in my teens, we lived in a wonderful old Victorian house in Tazewell. And I dreamed for, you know, sometimes once a month and then not again for two or three years of living in that house again. Okay. And um, at a certain moment, my wife's parents were near uh, Christiansburg, Virginia, and we wanted to be near them and some family, and we moved back up from Florida. Okay, from Boca Raton? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, well, we're glad to have you back in the mountains here, and we're glad to have you performing for us today, and uh, go ahead and tell us what's your first piece that you'll be playing today. The first piece that I'm going to play is the Yesu Joy of Men's Desiring. It was originally arranged by Dame Myra Hess, the great British pianist, who is still remembered for her, shall we say, valiant efforts during the Second World War. When the bombing was happening in London, they had a concert series that um, she just refused to cancel. And at, at a certain point when they were afraid that the glass dome would fall, you know, with the bombing, they moved the concerts downstairs, and they had them all, all during the Second World War. And this is a, a sort of respectful gesture to her. She 
played and, and made music throughout that period. And one of her um, signature pieces was the Yesu Joy. I've, she did a very pared down arrangement of the Bach, which is for chorus and trumpet and oboe and four part strings. And I have built on her arrangement, but I put a lot of the things that, that she left out. Right. I, I put those back. So I thought we've had a kind of difficult year. And this is a, a tip of the hat to somebody who persevered through truly difficult times. Right. Well, it just goes to show you how important live music is yes. during trying times. And that's why we're here having our call for performers too we need some live music even during our trying time so glad to have you on and we have the bach yesu joy of man's desiring so take it away when you're ready harold
Beautiful music there and a beautiful arrangement. And apparently, according to the New York, the New Oxford Companion to Music, the best-known transcription for piano is uh, of Yesu Joy Man's Desiring is by Dame Myra Hess. So that's yes, the best yes. one out there. Um, so thank you for that. Again, that was Johann Sebastian Bach's Yesu Joy of Man's Desiring, based on the Dame Myra Hess arrangement, formed live here in our studios by pianist Harold Brown. And we appreciate that beautiful arrangement there. Thank you. Uh huh. And so your theme for the afternoon is teachers and students. You have music by Faure and Ravel, and so you have, you know, a little bit of a connection between these composers and yourself and your teacher. So tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Let me. Um, this this De Mara Hess arrangement also has a little bit of connection with that. Okay. She had a very famous teacher. In, in England, whose name was Tobias Mate. And he only accepted a dozen students at a time. And she was, you know, his star pupil. And she um, really spread his name, you know, because people wanted to play like Dame Myra. And it happens that two of my teachers actually studied with Mate in England. And uh, when you were his student, he was Uncle Tobbs. Okay. So that's uh, the first student teacher connection. Mm -hmm. um, can I just explain a little bit about this this teacher student thing? Yeah. Always as a, a young pianist, I was I was wishing that I could talk to one of Bach's students or Bach himself, but you know, and find out how he would like his music, how Mozart would like their music played. Chopin, and it's true that with historical research we can determine somewhat, and um, so that's possible. But I realized there were pianists still alive who had contact with the great composers, and the uh, foremost one who came to my mind was Vlado Perlmutter in Paris, who had known and played for Faure, and this, he was one of two people to play all the Ravel works for Ravel. He did that in the 20s and played a couple of concerts that Ravel came to. You know, the you can do his piano music basically in two concerts. So the, um, the composer that we're going to play next is Gabriel Faure. It's very interesting because there's such a terrific line of teachers and students there. As a young man, he was a student of Camille Saint-Saëns, and um, he was obviously not a very good student. Saint-Saëns said that he tried to pay him to practice, and it didn't work. He, okay. he wouldn't do it. But um, <laughs> I would take him up on that. Obviously, <laughs> he did. He did practice because he was the head of the Paris Conservatoire, mm -hmm. and um, he was the teacher, the composition teacher of Maurice Ravel. So, uh, when Mr. Perlmutter was in his late teens, there was a competition in Paris, and um, the first prize winners from the conservatory of the past few years were allowed to enter. The head of the jury was Gabriel Faure, and the required piece was the theme and variations in C-sharp minor, which we're going to hear. Uh, in just a couple of minutes. He wrote it in the um, late, I think, 1895, 96. It was premiered. So it, it's from that period. It's from the same period as the Pavan of Ravel, which I'll, I'll do after. Mm -hmm. And um, it's uh, Faure's largest piano work, and I think one of his greatest ones. It's very much inspired by the Schumann symphonic etudes. Yeah. And uh, it's very expansive. In the same key. Okay. Yeah. All right. And it's yeah. very expansive, um, long theme and variations. I mean, there, there are a number of variations there. Eleven. Eleven variations. Yes. yes there you go. Yes. Um, well, um, play the theme. Can you just play the theme for us and just sure. so we can hear what it sounds like?
yeah, that's a dark, haunting theme in a very low key yes, on the piano. It's somehow reminiscent of the Schumann, the Schumann theme. Yeah, and um, I'm looking at this, and apparently Copeland, Aaron Copeland wrote of this work. He says, the theme itself has the same fateful march-like tread, the same atmosphere of tragedy and heroism that we might find in the introduction of Brahms's first symphony. So yes. it's a little mm. interesting comparison there. Yeah. I and mean, you can hear those dark undertones going. Yeah. And then I can imagine that the um, 11 and variations are very, you know, can, are sometimes in that vein, but sometimes very contrasting um, yes. and lively. So um, it'll be interesting to go through this uh, theme and variations by Faure. Anything else you want to say before taking off on this journey in C-sharp minor? Well, what I failed to say is that... Um, Mr. Perlmuter won that competition, and he, uh, just in the next few years, was able to play to foray a number of his compositions. And so it was, it was a privilege to study this with him and, and find what he had to say that he'd learned from foray himself. Yeah, that's an interesting connection between you, um, Mr. Perlmutter, and then Gabriel Faré himself, so yes. uh, just a couple of uh, um, uh, chains of separation there. Mr. Perlmuter was very old at the time that I studied with him, and, and he he always was talking about how old he was, but he said, the fact that I'm so old means that I'm on, the only person still alive who played to Faré. Okay, yeah. And right. so, you know, it was, uh, it was a wonderful, a wonderful uh, connection. Right. All right. Well, let's take let's take it away here. We have Faré's theme and variations as Opus 73 performed live here in our studios by Harold Brown.
Wow, that's an extensive work right there by Gabrielle Faure. That was his theme and variations, Opus 73. And that was performed live in our studio by Harold Brown at the piano. Thank you for that wonderful yeah. work in C sharp minor. And it was, I was talking about Copeland earlier and how he was talking about uh, the theme. And he was also talking about the tenth variation, how you know big and triumphant it was. And then you have to turn the page, and then you have this beautiful enigmatic sort of variation to close it out. Yes, yeah. yes. And it's interesting because the theme, which is essentially a scale, uh, and then it descends fr up from C sharp up to C sharp and back again. And the what one doesn't realize right away in listening is that the in that last variation the theme is now in the bass and mm -hmm. you know it it's uh, it it's said that that Ravel um Nadia Boulanger said that when she was in the Paris Conservatoire and Ravel was already a famous composer that he would come back to Faure's composition classes and uh sit and and do the exercises with the students and in this piece it's so beautifully disguised, but you see all of these, uh, you realize he was a composition teacher. Yeah. You know, the piece is so put together. Right. And it doesn't show. I don't think it shows at all. Right, right. Well, yeah, it's, of course, brilliantly composed, put together, mm -hmm. well-tempered, if you will, and, um, and put this together. And then your teacher... Vlado Perlmutter played it for the prize in, in Rome and won the competition. Yes. With Faure sitting there judging. Yeah. So that's an, that's incredible there. Uh, really cool connection between those two. And, and You know, it's interesting you mentioned the last variation. Sassons listened to uh, to this piece, and he told uh, Faure that, that he thought it was a masterpiece, but it would never be famous because it ends with that quiet variation at the end, which I think is one of the most beautiful things that I yeah. can think of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so you now have another piece by a French composer, and you have a piece by Maurice Ravel coming up. Yes. And that is his Pavon for a Dead Princess, which I played yesterday, and that was no accident. I played the orchestrated version. And now we're going to listen to the full piano version, which is the original version of this piece. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And this piece that he wrote in 1899 while he was studying at the Conservatory of Paris under Gabriel Faure. Yes. So tell us a little bit more about this piece you know, and what it means to you. Mm, it, it's a piece very early on before uh, Ravel started truly to sound like the mature Ravel. And it's a piece that he he thought sounded rather like Satie. And I don't remember, there was something you all were playing not very long ago of Satie. And I realized that it, it truly did. I didn't know the piece, uh -huh. but it reminded me of the kind of harmonies with the yeah. sevenths and ninths yeah, right. that this has. Right, that was big in that time period in France. Yes. But Ravel... Uh, manages here to pull out of his hat one of his most beautiful melodies. I know. And, yeah, yeah it, it's really lovely, I think. Absolutely. Um, and in the orchestral version, you'll hear it in the horn, but you'll hear it here um, in the right hand of the piano. And so, well, uh, if you're ready, we can go. We can take it away. We can listen to this yes. Pavon for a Dead Princess from 1899 by Maurice Ravel. And we have the solo piano version here performed live in our studios by Harold Brown.
beautiful music by Maurice Ravel. That was his Pavan for a Dead Princess. A work for solo piano that he wrote in 1899. Of course, there's an orchestral version that he wrote in 1910. But this is the original piano version that he wrote while studying at the Paris Conservatory under Gabrielle Faure. And we heard a performance with Harold Brown here in our studio performing live. And thank you for that beautiful work there. Thank you. And Matt, you can, there's a funny story. Ravel was always very witty and kind of sharp-tongued. Mm -hmm. And it seems that a young lady played this piece for him. And after she finished, she said, Well, mademoiselle, I wrote a pavane for a dead princess. Not a dead pavane for a princess. <laughs> That's so a good point. Yes, he, w he was very witty in that way. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point because uh, that is a beautiful piece, you know, and there's a lot of ins and outs in it. And um, and some of those chords, the parallel ninths and, you know, you hear the dominant seven chords and things like that. And it reminds me of music that Debussy was writing, like for chords you would hear in The Girl with the Flaxen Hair, for instance. Sure. And yeah. you have this parallel, that parallel movement. And, you know, that's so typical of that style in Paris and France at that yeah. time. So yeah. I love being able to hear that uh, come out. And I love that, you know, we've connected the Foray and Ravel uh, together there in yes. this program. Um, so anything else you'd like to say, Harold? I'm so glad you came on the show today and appreciate you. Well, all it's a your... pleasure to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's great to have you. And it's always nice to have live music. You know, it's not, it's been tough during these times to have yes. live performers on and so grateful to have you and all of the rest of our um, all of the rest of our call our performers from our call for performers on here on the show. So, um, well, with that, Harold Brown, thank you so much for coming on and performing live for us today. Pleasure. So that was Harold Brown, pianist from Bramwell, West Virginia, originally from Taswell, Virginia. Um, performing live there beautifully and now we're going to go out with a movement from the Verdi String Quartet in E minor and this is the second movement and it's performed by the Juilliard String Quartet which uh, the Juilliard School of Music is uh, one of the schools where Harold Brown uh, attended during his uh, time 